Hi, this is John Philip Pavage, co-director of a new documentary, Barbed Wire City, and you are watching The Pretentious Film Majors. Hey, what's up? I'm Ben from The Pretentious Film Majors. We're here with John Philip Pavage. I messed up your name again, didn't I? I think you did just fine, Ben. Thanks oh, for having man. me, man. How are you? John, thanks for joining me. <laughs> John here is the director, well, one of the directors yeah, of Barbed Wire City, uh, a documentary about the late, great ECW. So, how did you first get into, you know, the idea of making a documentary about ECW? We used to make, when I say we, my partner Kevin Kiernan and I have been like the best of friends since we were two. Even though we're not as close as we used to be, it's, mm -hmm. just, it's like a brother relationship, you know. Um, we're always intertwined, our families are intertwined, and um, we used to do creative things like from the time we were like five or six. We had like our own comic book at one point. Nice. We used to shoot like videos on the old over the shoulder VHSs and chop them together and um, all kinds of things. And then we started making movies when we were like 18 on like handy cams. And we made mock mockumentaries. Mm -hmm. It was a bit, we went through a phase where we just thought fake documentaries were the best thing. Yeah. And then one day I was like, I want to make a real documentary. So I lied to him. Well, I didn't lie. I, I really believed it would only take three months to do this because I was going to do like a fan thing about going to the ECW arena. Okay. Um, and I wrote down like four names to interview. And otherwise, I just wanted, they, said they had this crazy subculture. Like if anybody's ever gone to the ECW arena in South Philly, it's like a carnival on show day, you mm -hmm. know. So I wanted to like kind of capture that and talk about the history of it. It was going to be more fluffier than it was. It wasn't going to have nearly as much integrity, you know, or be objective. And it was just kind of be like a fan journal thing. And, said, like, let's do this for three months, and that was March of 2000. Of 2000? Yeah. Wow. I was 19, yeah. So how much has it evolved since the original idea? Oh, massively, and so many, I mean, the narrative of it, you just rewrite, you rewrite, mm -hmm. you know. Like I said, the original idea, and then I interviewed Todd Gordon, uh, who was the founder of yes. Eastern Championship Wrestling, which then became Extreme Championship Wrestling. Um, I hounded Todd for six to eight months, I think, started calling him in May of 2000. <clears throat> uh, I moved to Philly, to Center City, mm -hmm. not far from here, um, to go to the University of the Arts in late August, and that gave me permission to walk the, the less than a mile to Todd's place of business right. um, and bother him in person. <laughs> and it, I just wouldn't leave him alone, and finally he said, okay. And we interviewed him, and he was a saint, man. I interviewed him for two and a half hours. Nice. I kept him, at, his wife was calling, like, where are you? <laughs> He's like, how much longer? And I'm like, don't worry about it. And he had only done like one other interview on, on video other right. than us. And it was for his buddy Dave, Dave Shearer, who's our, also in our film. So yeah, <laughs> that was a, a little digression there. But after that interview, I was like, we have something serious here. He said a lot of things that made me go, I really have to like go find the people that he talked about right. uh, sort of in a negative portrayal. Mm -hmm. And positive too, uh, to kind of verify things. I realized I wanted to do something more journalistic, something with more integrity, and that's what right. a documentary is. It documents, and you research your butt off, and you try to figure out what the truth is, and thankfully I had a little bit of a background in following wrestling, and mm -hmm. um, we just researched and researched and kept talking to as many people as possible, and did, you know, here we are 13 years later, and 60-some right. interviews later. And So what makes your documentary? different than the ones that are out there now. Like there's the Rise and Fall, there's right. Forever Hardcore, right. you know, and like a bunch of mini ones in between. So where mm -hmm. does yours stand out amongst all of those? I always like hesitate when I talk about this because it, there's, a, there's this worry inside of me that I'm going to present myself as like arrogant by mm -hmm. stating like what I, what I think. Um, I was a fan of ECW. I bought Rise and Fall. I thought it was awesome that ECW was acknowledged with yeah. this documentary. I thought it was a very <clears throat> comprehensive timeline, but it was a wrestling video. Mm -hmm. And like, I was trying to make a documentary. It, it's really weird to call that a documentary in the sense that, and, and, and Forever Hardcore too, which was like a, a different, different guys, but the same kind of thing. It was made by people in the right. business. Jeremy Borash made that. Uh, Shane Douglas was involved in that. Um, it's really weird when the problem with these things is that wrestling people are involved, mm -hmm. um, and specifically the WWE. They bought, you know, the, the out of bankruptcy, yeah. the trademarks, the, the videotape library. They owned ECW, and they wanted to monetize it. Um, it's really weird to me to really call it a documentary when, like, if if Exxon Mobil buys one of their competitors mm -hmm. and then like puts out a 
documentary slash promotional video to like make money off of their purchase. I don't know how uh, honest or unbiased that's going to be. Right. Um, and that was really my problem when I watched it. It broke my heart because we started in 2000 and it was like 2005 when those things came out. And yep. I was like, oh. The Todd Gordon interview in Forever Hardcore is at his desk. It's like the same shot we have. Oh. So it was like, really? But you know what? I watched them several times. And again, I didn't hate them, but I was like, well, this is good. Now I don't have to cover storylines or any of that like wrestling-centric right. stuff. And I can really focus on being looking at this as a journalist kind of, you know, I mean, I don't have a journalism degree, but mm -hmm. documenting. Um, so the thing that we really started to focus on was the underdog business venture story and these collection of people, the real people. I didn't want to interview Raven. I wanted to interview mm. Scott Levy, the person. Right. I didn't want to interview Axel Rotten. I want to interview Brian Knighton. And that became kind of the focus mm. where, where we were really, we don't talk anything about storylines. Uh, we don't talk about really character stuff at all. I mean, guys are mentioned for the things that they do, and uh, and their the main focus was how can we make this accessible to the mainstream public? Because that's the other problem with those two. I don't know that it's necessarily a problem. WWE made a lot of money off of their their mm -hmm. release, um, and I think they're fine with staying in that little bubble. Um, my goal was to get this out to people who never watch wrestling, and to try to you know form you know, show a subculture right. and, and, and show the heart of these people, so to speak. Um, whereas, like, I've never met somebody who wasn't super into wrestling uh, who watched Forever Hard Hardcore or uh, Extreme uh, what was it? Rise and Fall, ECW. Mm -hmm. It's just something that they wouldn't even know about and they wouldn't probably sit through. You know what I mean? It's done in a different light. Um, they don't touch on anything. Like, the Eric Kulas incident really isn't covered in Rise and Fall. Mm -hmm. That's something that was, like, a major part of the company. You know, this kid got cut and like almost bled out in the ring and it was a whole thing. And, yeah. You know, it almost cost them their pay-per-view. And <clears throat> it was just like touched on in the lightest way because they don't want to really address like the fact that these guys are cutting themselves for their job, yeah. that they were like jumping off of balconies for next to no money for the promise of something <clears throat> better. You know, there was, you know, give credit to Paul Heyman who was kind of the mastermind who took over that company. Mm -hmm. um, being a team player is pretty antithetical to being a pro wrestler. It's a very self-involved business. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very like dog-eat-dog -dog business. And he took all these like alpha males and convinced them that they were on a team and branded that company and wrote it like that. And he got his audience such emotional buy-in. Like if you're, if you're doing any kind of entertainment venue, uh, venture, you can only hope for that kind of emotional buy-in. Mm -hmm. Where people are willing to like, for no money, just like the strictly ECW guys, uh, Tony Lewis, who's featured in our movie. Tony was never paid by them, and Tony was an involved fan who used to write cable stations, pay per view providers. Um, he would start grassroots efforts to make people aware of ECW, to, mm -hmm. to uh, broaden their, their, uh, their reach, things like that. Like, you didn't get that with WWE or WCW during that day. You yeah. know, it's different thing because it wasn't corporate. It was very do-it-yourself punk rock, you know, and that, that's the kind of stuff I want to show. Oh, cool. So you mentioned the big name like Todd Gordon, but who else did, were you able to get for your documentary that was like, you know, that you were just like, wow, this guy really had an impact in ECW, I'm glad I got him. We don't really focus on one particular, it wasn't like we followed people around, like Barry Blonstein did with uh, Beyond the Mat. Mm -hmm. um, that was an idea at one point. It was one of the many narrative things. You okay. know, you'd asked about like how many times the story changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it changed even in editing in the last, in the, like back last fall. Not huge, but just mm -hmm. we rearranged things. You realized we could refocus things. The main guys that I think really start to stand out are your signature guys that weren't going to that next level. Okay. And that's like Axel Rotten, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Balls Mahoney, uh, and New Jack. Um, and I'll, I'll feel weird. <laughs> it's it's weird because like you're a wrestling fan. Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like I should really be saying like, you know, Jerome Young, Brian Knight, and yeah. John Rettner, you know what I mean? Because that's really who we're talking to. But people would know them by, by, by those mm -hmm. names. Those are the people that we really focus on because they did the craziest stuff. Yeah. They weren't paid well. <laughs> um, and those are the people who felt betrayed when the company went bankrupt. And they were kind of left there going like, it's like uh, the end of few, A Few Good Men mm -hmm. where the soldiers are like, why are we in trouble? We, did, we just did what we're supposed to do. And they didn't understand. And that's how those guys were, too. Right. They're bitter for a while because they were just like, 
I did everything that was asked of me. I nearly killed myself for no money, for all these promises. And then Paul Heyman, you know, when the company, the company fell apart, he didn't call anybody. He just left for WWE, which is the largest, you know, wrestling, pro wrestling entertainment group in the world, mm-hmm. you know. And they were kind of left sitting there, you know what I mean? I think it's an interesting story to tell, you know. And also this, this, this like, mini, you know, Rage Against the Machine company comes out of nowhere, makes this impact, and just falls, falls short. And they get swallowed up by this corporation that they were, you know, rallying against. Right. And the person who makes all the money is Vince McMahon. Mm-hmm. You know, that's like this sad poetic thing. You know, they, they like it begged to be covered. Uh, so, were there any any uh, particular people that you wanted to get that you couldn't, or just like things didn't work out? Obviously, Paul Heyman. Mm-hmm. Paul's very well represented through file footage and also people who are his confidants within the movie. I think you get a really. I think it was really neat challenge to study somebody who wouldn't sit for you. Mm-hmm. He, I think he just knew better. You know what I mean? Right. Eh, that sounds kind of cocky, but like, I, if I were him, I wouldn't sit with me. Mm-hmm. Especially if he heard like the kind of questions I was asking. Weren't like fanboy questions, so I was like, <laughs> you know, so, so you know, Heyman, Dreamer, and, you know, uh, one of the executives in the company that people don't really know, I had negotiated to, to do an interview with him, and ultimately he declined at this point. So uh, that was unfortunate because you could have gotten a little bit more inside. Last question. Sure. Uh, you know, average movie going fan isn't really into the world of pro wrestling. Right. What is your quick elevator pitch oh, for Barbed Wire City? I'm so bad on this, which is why I live in Allentown <laughs> and not Lo- uh, Los Angeles. Um, I would say it's a study of, uh, it's, it's a look into a bygone era of not only pro wrestling, but like a subculture of a subculture. Um, I think niche, <clears throat> niche entertainment en- entities are interesting. These people really believe that they are entertainers, and that is why they did what they did. There's a certain, and that they're violent performance artists, and it's a very misunderstood business. I'm not saying that everything about it is right, and that's why it's misunderstood, yeah. but it's something that people don't really know about. You know, a lot of details people don't know about, and I think that this film really goes into that through, that lens through ECW. Um, And I think it's a very human story. I think that there are moments you're gonna laugh during the movie. I think there's moments where you're gonna get emotional. And I think your opinions will change with people, and some people are just gonna jump off of the screen at you, and you're gonna be like, I love that guy. Like, I I thought wrestlers were all dumb, or they were all violent, and and I go, I'd have that guy at my house. You know what I mean? I think there's a very human story here. So, John, where can we find out information about Barbed Wire City? Our official uh, page is barbedwirecity.com, which should be easy to remember if you can remember the name of it. Uh, we have DVDs that will go on sale April 20th to coincide with the premiere. We have premiere tickets, you know, up until the day of the show, and then you can get them at the door. Posters, T-shirts, all things. But I, I write a blog. It's all at barbedwirecity.com. For more from the Pretentious Film Majors, check out all the videos on our channel. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or go to the pretentiousfilmmajors.com.